started. All right, I'm your host tonight, Q, and I'm joined by two very awesome guys today, uh, Raphael and Chris. Uh, both of these guys are amazing heroes, work for Hero Devs. I believe they're both, you guys both seniors are both architects or something? Or uh, one senior, one architect, maybe? They're just nodding. I think that's good. I, I'm right. a senior. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm <laughs> All right, well, well it's all... Chris, it's, is, Chris is closer to an architect, so I'll give him that. <laughs> All right. Um, it is our favorite time of the year again, where we're going to start doing our NGConf webinars on the road to NGConf. Um, just like before, uh, all of the NGConf webinars follow the same code of conduct as a person or in person or live NGConf. Uh, the NGConf code of conduct has been provided for you in the chat. It's at the very top. Um, tonight we're going to be going over discovering or taking a deep dive rather and discovering angular 17's hidden treasures so i'll let whoever i guess Raphael will take it off first yeah sounds good all right awesome thanks for thanks for having me uh for the opportunity to share this with you folks tonight uh i'm gonna go ahead and assume that everyone can see my screen um So yeah, uh, one of the most exciting features in Angular's history, or at least in my opinion, is signals. Uh, and signals aren't a new concept by far, but they're new to Angular. And so uh, I, I won't go deep into it, but I want to talk about what they represent for me and for the purpose of uh, setting up for this segment. Um, the main thing for me is uh, to move towards finer grained reactivity. Optimizing for performance is super important for web apps and being able to pinpoint which parts of the UI need to be updated is a big, big step. Uh, that kind of ties into the, my next point, which is moving away from zone JS uh, by using signals to track state or, or rather UI state. Uh, we won't need to check uh, huge component trees for changes so we can rely on that instead of zone, which translates into improved performance and best of all, improved developer experience. And finally, making RSTS optional. This is kind of a controversial topic nowadays, but from the outside and for beginners, and in my opinion, RSTS is kind of a pain point for learning Angular. Um, it's a super powerful library, but it's hard to learn and it's very easy to misuse. So now, not only can we build Angular apps without it, but they provide us with a bridge to transition from either direction seamlessly. So the focus of this segment is going to be to talk about the RxJS interop package, which is part of Angular core and contains all the tools you need to integrate signals in RxJS. You can continue to choose to use one or the other, but with this, you don't have to make that choice. Uh, there are places where either one or the other shine. So let's look at where we can use them, where we shouldn't, if we can go all in, or uh, what, how we can make it work. Uh, so this example contains uh, different types of RxJS constructs. But first, let's give a quick intro for uh, about how we set up this app. First of all, it's ocean-themed, like ng-conf, obviously. Um, and so we, we set up kind of like uh, an article view here with a couple of ships. And we implement it in such a way that uh, the values come in individually. So uh, we're going to see how we're using RxJS to achieve that, um, how that, how we can translate some of that to signals, um, and how the RxJS interop package uh, plays, plays its role. Um, so before we get into it, uh, I want to kind of back up to one thing, which isn't directly relevant to the RCS interrupt package, but it's just something that I, I like to suggest. Uh, since one of the goals of using signals is to achieve fine-grained reactivity, I think these um, this pattern of creating an all-encompassing view model um, is sort of contrary to that goal. So what I like doing is uh, I like to keep data uh, data consumption as close to the source as possible. So I'm going to get rid of that view model, and I'm going to use the observables directly, uh, where where the changes that they are scoped to 
need to happen. There we go. So now we got rid of the view model. We have fine-grained observable reactivity, kind of. So we can go into uh, the interrupt package. Um, so at a glance, we can see that we have a few RxJS constructs in here. We have observables, we have combined observables, we have subjects, behavior subjects, which are all pretty similar under the hood. Um, but it's worth pointing out um, that we, we use multiple types of these. Uh, and the one that, to me, is closest to the signals is the behavior subject. Because the behavior subject has an initial value. You can read the value at any time synchronously. And you can update the value. So let's go ahead and start by replacing that behavior subject with a signal. And we can see right off the bat that a couple of things broke because as observable doesn't exist on signal and a couple of other things that we were using. So let's update those. Uh, down here we have uh, an, kind of an updater function. So let's replace that with the equivalent now that we're using a signal. We could do we could either do this and set it directly, or we can use update to derive the value from the previous state. All right, uh, I'm, I'm going to use this one uh, since it's a toggle to make sure that the data is in sync. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is we were converting that behavior subject to an observable for our consumption in a couple of places. So this method doesn't exist anymore. And here's where we can showcase the first utility from the RxJS interrupt package to observable. So this one is pretty straightforward. Um, it's a function. You pass it signal, not, not reading the value. You pass it the signal, and it converts it to an observable of the same type. Uh, you can also pass it an options object. In this case, it only takes an injector. Um, for certain advanced use cases, I won't go into it uh, a lot here. So uh, we're just going to skip over that. And here, we can replace that with our converted observable. One more thing we can do is, instead of consuming an observable here in the template, we can now replace that with a signal. Uh, and this should have the same outcome. So here, uh, we have that to change the value of the button. We have it behaving as intended. Um, and then we see that the rest of our implementation works as expected. Next, uh, we just went over how to convert a signal to an observable. So let's look at the other way around. I'm going to go ahead and, and um, convert this one because this is the one that's being consumed in the template. And I kind of want to get away from uh, using observables in the template. So I do need this to be an observable because of the operations I'm performing on it. Um, Actually, I might not need to, but um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to stick to converting this to a signal using the anal analogous to signal um, function. So that uh, is going to do kind of the same thing that the other one did. Uh, this converts a signal to an observable. This converts an observable to a signal. And we can do the same thing. We can now um, use the signal in the template, reload the page, and our functionality is the same as it was, signals interoperating with uh, observables. That's pretty cool. Um, we can probably dig into this code and find more opportunities or more perceived opportunities to convert observables to signals. But we don't necessarily want to do that all the time because RxJS still has its place. It will continue to have its place for advanced use cases. And one of those cases is to uh, to handle anything that has to do with time. 
here we are piping this subject um, into a throttle time. And what we're doing here is we're preventing the first button from uh, launching too many times in succession. You can't see it, but I'm clicking a bunch of times and that is limited to uh, one second. So for those cases, you might be able to convert this to a computed or a signal somehow. Um, but like I said, this is where RCS shines. So uh, we're going to stick to RCS here and we're going to keep looking for uh, other scenarios where we can, or we might be able to replace um, RCS with signals. That, that shouldn't be an end goal though. Um, for instance, my end goal in this case was to look for opportunities to consume signals in the template because they're they're optimized for that um, and to uh, get rid of the async pipe and to, uh, I, I think in the future, uh, when it comes to signal-based components specifically, you won't be able to use the async pipe at all. Um, so it's nice to find these ways where uh, we can go over your entire application and find out where it makes sense to make those conversions. Don't um, blindly transform everything into, into signals because that's um, not scalable in the long run. Um, let's see. Let's find a way that we can um, combine them more because here uh, we're converting an entire observable to a signal and here we're converting a signal to an observable. Let's see if we can get them uh, working together in one of these streams. Um, okay, so here I have a method that's not being used. Uh, it's mocking a an API call where it returns an observable, um, and it's going to return an item based on the ID, which is not really an ID, it's an index, uh, but it serves our purpose of having uh, a dynamic uh, call uh, that that's going to depend on something that comes in from a signal. So we're going to create a new signal and we're going to call it um, search ID. Uh, we're going to set it to null. And what we're going to do here is we're going to bind it to this input. We're going to use ND model. And we're going to bind it. Uh, this is a pretty recently added feature where uh, you can provide a signal to anything that supports two-way binding. And it will handle that seamlessly for you. This is more or less syntactic sugar for binding this to the uh, value of the signal and then making an ng model change update the signal. So that's also pretty neat. We're, we're going to stick to the two-way binding for now. And um, we're going to create an observable that takes the value from this signal and combines it with this observable to display something on the screen. Um, let's see. Let's call it search result. Search result is going to be a signal. Um, let me see. It's going to be a signal. It comes from this originally, but I need to convert that to an observable first. I'm going to pipe it, and I'm going to switch map to to a call that actually, that also handles the null value. So there's a lot of cases, as you can see, where RSDS will continue to shine. Um, and not only is the knowledge transferable, but there's a lot of operations, like not only time-based things, but uh, error handling is a place where uh, RSDS still that will continue to, to shine.
uh, and in this case, uh, an observable made sense as well. So I'm going to take the result of that. I'm going to keep using ng if. Okay. Not the best layout, but um, it illustrates the point nicely. We are taking signal, converting it to an observable, piping it to another observable, and then converting it back to a signal. Awesome. So other than that, um, I'm going to go over this uh, briefly, but to signal supports a couple of options, like setting an initial value, which by default is undefined. You can set it to require sync, and this is going to ensure that the observable that it's subscribing to is um, has value immediately. There's also reject errors, which uh, bounces back errors to RxJS, so you handle them on uh, the RxJS side. And that keeps the errors out of the signal. So for some cases, you might want to do that. And your signal will continue to have the latest good value. Uh, there's We have manual cleanup, um, which is going to uh, prevent the signal from getting destroyed when this injection context gets destroyed. Um, so you, you have to be careful with that one. But if you need to keep a subscription around for some reason, then um, this is what you need. And uh, I'm missing more than one. Um, I know there's the injector for advanced use cases where you are creating signals outside of an injection context. And I'm missing one more. Uh, no, I covered them. Perfect. Um, two more utils that come from uh, the RxJS interrupt package are take until destroyed operator, whoops, take until destroyed, which is also used in an injection context to register uh, an observable to be cleaned up automatically whenever uh, its context is destroyed. So no more uh, having to implement the lifecycle hook and doing that manually in cases where you actually need to subscribe manually, of course. And is signal. Um, and I'll, I'll let you make a wild guess what that is for. Um, so yeah, uh, in conclusion, um, don't go all in signals unless you have zero need for synchronous operations. Uh, this package is meant to help increase adoption of Angular and um, lower the learning curve. Uh, but you will still need to reach for RxJS in, in a lot of cases. And um, yeah, hopefully this leads to newer patterns and, and um, better control over your components and the rendering process and uh, better architectures in general. All right, thanks, Rafa. All right. Okay, I should be sharing my screen now. Um, all right, um, so <clears throat> we're going to continue working with this uh, same repository, and we're going to be looking at the new control flow syntax that is with Angular. Um, it's in developer preview, but um, it's a really cool feature, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, one of my favorite things about it is not just that there's some performance improvements, but that this really improves the developer experience with authoring components. Um, so let's get into it. Um, first, we're going to look at the treasure list component. This is our main component that has a section with some treasures. And we're using ng4 to loop over these treasures and display them on the page. Um, so right now, we're using this structural directive that Angular uses to render out a whole bunch of these treasures. Um, and we're going to switch that to use the new control flow syntax. Uh, so if you have the Angular, Angular language service up to date and you're using Angular 17, um, you can just go in here and hit the app key. And you'll see a whole bunch of 
new options that we can use um, for a control flow. Um, for this one, since we're doing an NG4, we're going to use the four control flow. Um, and it's going to go ahead and give me this like the the boilerplate code here. So we're going to switch this from NG4 let treasure of treasures. We're going to say for treasure of treasures again. Um, that's going to create our loop. And if we don't do a track, uh, we're actually going to get a syntax error here. Um, the, the new control flow syntax is requiring that we use a track key, um, which is great for performance for Angular. And what's really awesome is before with ng4, we would have to say track and then some kind of track function. And you have to go into your component code and write a function that essentially just returns the key used for uh, tracking those DOM objects. Um, with the new control flow, we can just say what we want to track right here in our template. Um, so I could say something like treasure dot, maybe there's an ID, we want to track by the name, um, or we can use uh, what they had here before, which is index. Index is one of uh, several little keywords that you can use um, inside of the for loop. Um, let's see, we've got quite a few. There's There's index, which will start at zero and go up for each one. Um, we have count, which is the total number of count in the loop. Um, we have first, last, even, and odd, um, which you can use those for various styling purposes or anything you want to do where um, maybe there's something in particular on the last element uh, that you want to control within your template. Uh, so let's go ahead and move our treasure into this block. And I'm going to remove the ng4 here. Go ahead and save it. Um, and now that we've removed ng4, we can actually get rid of the common module because um, we don't have to import anything to use new control flow syntax. It's uh, out of the box with Angular. Um, so it's very easy to use on to write imports, uh, makes testing easier. You don't have to worry about mocking anything. OK, so I've saved it. The application, as you can see, I'm refreshing. It's still working exactly the same. Um, let's go into the treasure component. Um, we have an ng if here, and we have a new control flow syntax for that as well. Uh, so we go in here, there is an if. Uh, and we can just put what we're ifing here. So our details are visible and create a block. And let's move that paragraph up here. And I can get rid of this ng if. And now as the details are visible, we have a paragraph that shows the description. And also in this card, we have these contents that are displayed. Um, so let's see where that's at. Okay, right here, we have an ng container with an ng if. Um, so we'll just do the same thing here. Ng if contents and wrap this whole thing. And since we're getting rid of the ng if, we actually don't even need this ng container anymore. So we can get rid of that completely. And that's going to work the same. And then we have another loop here. So again, let's use the for loop content of contents. And I'm just going to track by the index and wrap all this up and get rid of the ng4. And now that we've gone through all that, we can again go in our imports and say, we don't need ngf, we don't need ng4 of. Uh, so it really cleans up our component. Uh, we can take this a step further. There's uh, some additional things we can do here. Um, for instance, on the for loop, we can jump in here and see what else is in here. Um, empty, this is a cool block. Um, there are no ships. And we're not going to see this because we we have items in our array that we're iterating over. But this is a way that we can put something into our template where if the for loop is coming up empty, instead of doing an ng if where we say if the contents dot length is zero, display this thing, um, we can just wrap it in an empty block. Um, also the same thing with with if we can we can also do else or else if if you have several cases. Um, so we can do something like in here. No contents found. And again, we won't see anything here because um, we do have contents. Um, but this is a huge developer experience improvement, in my opinion. Um, before, you'd have to use an Angelic template. You'd have to get a template ref. Um, the code was a little bit confusing. And I think for beginners coming in Angular, it was pretty tricky. 
Um, so if you've ever done what the ng if else is and always forgotten, you have to go to the docs and see what it is. Um, much easier with with else's. Uh, they've also given us switch statements, uh, which also, again, just like ng if else, really cleans up the um, the code for that. Uh, there's cases in here, so it feels a lot like you're writing JavaScript with a with a switch and uh, cases. All right, I think we've cleaned up all of the control flow syntaxes for this. Um, there's even more blocks. Uh, you probably noticed as I hit the at symbol here. And uh, I think Q is going to go next and show us how to use the defer blocks, which is uh, uh, something that's pretty cool. He said he thinks, but man, they put me on the spot <laughs> on this one. <laughs> I Good did luck. write an article about uh, about deferable views. So if you want to look at Angular in depth, there is an article that talks a little bit about deferred views versus like dynamic component loading. Um, in the past, we had a lot more verbose um, syntax that we needed in order to dynamically load a component. Um, now with deferable views, we can just use pretty much what Chris just showed with a bunch of templating um, syntax that we can just say defer loading of this component until um, until some trigger, some some type of activation. And I'll share my screen as well. We'll walk through this together because I uh, <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot of time to really really play with it, but. Um, Let's take a look at it. So I'm using WebStorm. So my syntax highlighting itself is going to be a little different than what they were looking at. I did go ahead and follow along with Chris while he was talking. Um, but the only section that we are able to really play with um, with the, this deferable view is this component that's nested inside of this treasure. Um, the reason is, is because when Angular is compiling, it's looking for certain um, things that are deferrable. You can't just defer HTML syntax or HTML elements. You have to um, defer a component, a pipe, a directive, um, and uh, I believe there's one more. But you can't you can't defer a service. You can't defer HTML elements. But anything that's inside of that dependency inside of that view template, you could defer. Um, the syntax is pretty simple. So here we, we're saying we want to defer loading of those treasures until something. So we can say at defer, um, any, like by default, I could just defer this. Um, behind the scenes, the defer is going to work a little different than the for and the if. Um, it's going to just say defer until idle, um, which would look something like, um, oh. It would look like, oh my gosh, I think because I already spaced. No, it just has a, a bug, an extra parenthesis goes in. Um, so we can just say when idle, uh, I think, is it on idle? On idle. There we go. On idle. Uh, on idle is once the window calls, um, the window is going to call the request idle callback, uh, which is a process on the browser that just looks for any or waits for all the calls that were being called or network calls on the on the browser to to, to end. So once they've ended, then we will load the the component that's inside of the defer block. Um, so if we refresh this, nothing really changes because, like Chris said, we already have the content here. But if if we didn't, it would it would hold out loading those until everything else on the page is loaded and then show the screen or show those treasures. An extra thing you can do with, with defers, I'll go into more defers in a second, but just like Chris did, you have an extra an extra thing here that we can do. Um, it's called placeholder. There's also loading. So we can do a placeholder to show until some request or some amount of time has ended. We can also make triggers here for placeholders. Loading is the exact same way. So we can have some type of loading spinner that activates um, for a certain amount of time or until something happens, and then it'll show what was deferred. In this case, we'll just do a placeholder. Um, and we'll say like the, the keyword here we're going to use is minimum. And we'll say 2000. That's going to be two seconds. I think these, I think there's something that loads. I think it's the content inside of the treasure loads after three sec or after three seconds, but I think you have to click on details. So it's not going to work as well. But for the, for the best part, we will be able to see that uh, let's do like, uh, I think there's articles inside of here. Um, 
And then we can give it a class of, mm, we'll say treasure plate, or we'll do placeholder. Um, for now, that's what that'll look like. Um, and after two seconds, we will, or we'll, we'll immediately see this, uh, hopefully. And then, um, oh, there's nothing there, but you do see that there's something there that's loading. If we want it to play with it, if we want it to go really hardcore, we could style something on this. Um, but let's be, let's, let's make something pretty. We're already here. Let's do something cool. Um, let's make something that looks similar to, to these. So it'd almost be like a skeleton loader. We have, um, these contents are 258 across and 432. I'm not going to remember that number. So 258 across. So let's go back here and let's create a new class. <clears throat> I've already forgot what that first number was. <laughs> but we will copy and paste this guy. And then the width, I think, was 252. 258. Oh, so close. All right, 258 pixels. Um, What else do we want to do with this? We have to... Actually, we can do something like... Um, we have an article here of a treasure container. Um, hmm... Let's go with like a placeholder. Oh, placeholder container. Um, and we will do a separate thing here. Called placeholder container. Guys, I'm I'm sorry that I'm having the live code. I wish I could hear you guys cheering for me. Um, this is all the top of the head. <laughs> um, I think one caveat about placeholders and, um, and, oh, there, there, there they are. Uh, placeholders and loadings is that you can only have one root. So I can't like have an NG4 or something here that's iterating and making a bunch of root elements. You have to, you'd get an error as soon as you try to do it. In this case, though, I'm going to have a placeholder container that's going to hopefully simulate the same um, grid structure as the last one, the treasures container. And then inside of it, we have placeholders. Um, let's see what that looks like first. I'm still, okay, we're getting close. There, there's, there's something there. We have one. Um, so we should be able to create some type of an array to make a skeleton loader here that can kind of give us that same look. Um, we can steal what Chris did maybe um, and do a four here. Chris, I should, I probably need you for this. Um, if I wanted to create an array dynamically, I know you can do something like number of, um, you can do like array dot constructor maybe, um, and then pass in like 10. Um, is that right? Is that the right syntax? And then track index. I think I'm missing something on that. I think you need to also add something else after that. But this might get us if it loads. Oh, there it is. Oh that man, we're so close. We're so close. Um, I, I I couldn't remember the syntax either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm close, but but you you get the gist. Um, if if I can also get this grid to also align right, I'm not sure why it, why it didn't did the grid not work. See now we're gonna start debugging. Um, but if the grid had worked the way I wanted it to, it would look just like it. And so after those two seconds had passed, then we would have gotten our actual stuff here, our our actual content with the treasures. I said we could talk a little bit more about the ons. Um, I have the on idle, which just like I said means that uh, request idle callback is going to um, to trigger, and we'll get our treasure. Um, this one is specifically telling us that hey, um, after two seconds, stop showing the placeholder, and then do the defer. Um, there's going to also be other ons like viewport. So once the once the element here is within the viewport, then do the loading. Um, there's other things as well that you can do to kind of make things really cool. Um, 
You can do prefetching, uh, and you can combo those with the ons and wins as well. So I could do a prefetch on hover, go ahead and start loading those dependencies inside of here. And then once um, I go into viewport, um, obviously prefetch hover and on viewport will work well. But if I had a prefetch trigger, um, a prefetch win trigger, you can have a button or like a card element or something above it. Uh, once you hover over it or once you click it, then it prefetches the data until it goes into the viewport and then it loads the treasures. So you can get really complex with it. Um, it, it keeps things smooth. Um, I think that's one of the big uh, benefits. Kind of right, Raphael kind of talked on that a little bit about some of the, the benefits you get from signals. Um, signals have these intergrained um, spots on the templates that kind of help um, dynamically load things cleaner. We didn't have that before, before IV. And now that IV is everywhere, we do have the benefits of doing these dynamic loadings and clean loadings on our templates.